Well before the Europeans arrived, the area that was to become Nigeria had vast resources, almost a million square kilometers at the heart of West Africa. From Atlantic shores to Sahara Desert, and everywhere in between, a country of varied landscapes, of wild and rich vegetation. In the south, a vista of swamps and lagoons, creeks and waterways. Further north, the hilly terrain of the Jos Plateau. A contrast with the hinterland, giving way to savanna bush, merging into the desert. A natural heritage unique in Western Africa. But since early times, it was the rivers that shaped the region's commerce. The two broad rivers that straddled the countryside, the Niger and the Benue. It was here that native traders moved their produce. These were the arteries that made trade possible. River commerce the lifelines of the region for centuries. People here were divided along tribal lines with a history of great empires and city-states, Fulani and Hauteland in the north, Yorubaland in the west, Iboland in the east. But behind these broad divisions lay a teeming diversity of tribes and peoples over 250 ethnic groups, hundreds of languages and dialects. Today's Nigerian culture was formed in the centuries before foreign traders came. Geography shaped its cultural diversity. In the north, the pull of Islam and sub-Saharan commerce. Structured societies under kings and emirs, providing security for their traders. Strong hierarchies, organizing all aspects of their kingdom regulating political life and social and economic customs. Further south and to the east, the vast Niger River Delta with its more diverse societies, its traders traveling a multitude of waterways through thousands of tiny villages. Ruling the villages were councils of elders. There were no kings in these parts. The traders bartered with tribes in the hinterland, fish and salt against vegetables and tools. Further west, the vast centralized kingdoms of the Yoruba and Benin, kingdoms but still diverse peoples. Throughout the area that was to become Nigeria, people lived within the framework of their tribe. Traditional rulers held sway over their people. In most cases, there were no problems of succession, and that made for stable government. These were the shores to which foreign traders came. First, the Portuguese in the 16th century. But by the mid-1800s, it was the British presence that had grown the most. Not only traders, but explorers and missionaries also. From coastal outposts, they set up trade routes into the interior. This gradual opening of trade routes led to direct commerce between African producers and the Europeans. British traders were already infringing on the commerce of native chiefs. As trade grew by 1850, the British government was ready to intervene to secure its profitable centers of trade and carry out commerce on its own terms. In 1851, on the pretext of suppressing the slave trade in Lagos, British gunboats bombarded the city. The British deposed and expelled the king and installed their own friendly ruler. Ten years later, after continuing disorder, they were to annex the city by treaty. The British claimed the treaty was an agreement between two mutually interested parties. 